Okay, welcome to lecture 14.1. Uh, we're going to talk about simulating the equations of motion of a system that has explicit holonomic constraints. So let's switch over to the tablet. All right, first I'll introduce the ideas that we'll use here, and then after that we'll do a problem. Okay. So, like I said, we're going to talk about simulating uh, a multi-body system. with holonomic constraints. So our, we already know that our formulation with generalized coordinates eliminates most constraints except if we have an additional um, one or more additional holonomic constraints that the generalized coordinates can't fully uh, can capture. For example, we had the four bar linkage in the chapter where we introduced the idea of holonomic constraints. And then you also solved a uh, Hukens linkage in your homework, which had an, uh, an additional holonomic constraint. So recall that um, we have generalized coordinates, n of them, for some system. And then I'll introduce. Um, capital M dependent coordinates. And this gives us big N equals N plus big M uh, total coordinates. The, general, the uh, dependent ones are not generalized coordinates by definition and we end up with then these holonomic constraints that look like this they involve only the generalized coordinates and these dependent coordinates and possibly time as an explicit variable and, and they take this form there are uh, capital M of them and if you could solve these equations maybe you could eliminate the M uh, dependent Q coordinates QR but these equations are nonlinear in general and it's not um, possible or non-trivial to solve for QR If they were, then you would only work with the generalized coordinates Q and just solve for them. So this means that uh, our equations of motion take a different form now because we have these um, holonomic constraints. And I'm just going to talk about a holonomic system here. Um, you can extend this to a non-holonomic system too that has extra holonomic constraints. Um, and you would talk about p degrees of freedom instead of n degrees of freedom. All right, so they basically look like this, right? I'll just write again, we have the constraints, 
we would have some kinematical differential equations. And in this case, um, we have u generalized, uh, we should generalize speeds u that correspond to the uh, n um, generalized coordinate. So we'd have n of those. We'd have q dot present. But then we'd also have um, qr dot, q and qr, and then also possibly t here. All right, so here we have uh, m equations. Here we're going to, in general, have a, um, a little n equations, right, for each of the uh, u's and the q dots. And then uh, also some dynamical differential equations that will look like u dot and u as expected. But then if we just um, have these qr terms present, we would end up with uh, qr double dot present, qr dot present, uh, q and qr, I believe, and then t all equal to zero, and once again, we have n for the number of degrees of freedom there. So these uh, equations now give us uh, 2n plus big M equations, and um, we have a number of unknowns here. Typically, if we didn't have holonomic constraints, right, we just have these of 2n unknowns and we can solve for the uh, the differential equations for the q dots and the u dots but we also have present here qr qr dot and qr double dot which amount to 3m more unknowns and we only have this extra equation with uh, that gives us these m extra constraints so we don't completely have enough information here to solve the system. Um, another key thing is that uh, this set of equations now are not ordinary differential equations. Um, they're more generally right, e. These equations are uh, called differential algebraic equations. And then we often abbreviate them as DAEs. Okay. These two equations are still differential equations, uh, but this one, or this set of equations, are the algebraic equations. We have no time derivatives present in that. So the total, the total thing, differential algebraic equations, and they're a bit more difficult to deal with. Right? Um, so I said here that we have these 3m uh, unknowns here associated with these dependent coordinates, right? Um, we can introduce some more equations by differentiating these holonomic constraints. And if you read more about differential algebraic equations, you can uh, reduce the so-called index of the DAEs. We're going to introduce the derivatives of the algebraic equation. So we would have something like f dot of h, and we could write it as u, q, uh, qr dot, q, and t match our, our form there. So we have the q dot term, 
and then if I take the uh, der time derivative, sorry, I, one more time, and we have a, a u dot u q as normal, but then qr dot qr dot uh, qr t equals zero, and then each of these are also capital M equations. So now we've got enough equations to match these number of unknowns and maybe we could solve that system. Okay. And uh, you can work with those equations directly and uh, you'll find in a lot of multi-body dynamics books that um, do. You twice differentiate any of these holonomic constraints and um, and then you can use these equations along with the dynamical differential equations to formulate um, a new set of equations um, and we'll learn a bit more about that in the very in the last um, chapter uh, or last lecture of the, of the course where I'll introduce um, an alternative method of formulating the uh, equations of motion but here <clears throat> we can actually exploit uh, a similar method um, that we did with the non holonomic constraints to reduce these equations into a bit more favorable form um, without having to deal with uh, at least the f double dot term explicitly. So recall how we eliminated the dependent. generalized speeds in non-holonomic systems. I think that was the prior lecture. We can do something similar here. So I'm going to introduce the generalized speeds of the system, um, which that is of length little n, but also we'll introduce some extra uh, generalized speeds um, that are tied to the dependent coordinates uh, effectively. And that, and we'll have a uh, big M of those uh, also. All right. So U. These are the generalized speeds as we've always done. And uh, you are. I'm going to call them uh, pseudo generalized speeds right because we're in they're not there because they're tied to the uh, uh, degrees of freedom of the system uh, but they are extra and we'll use them to our advantage to formulate the equations right all right so we're back to then the holonomic constraint which we can write as such and there's m of those um, and now I'm going to have some kinematical differential equations and they're going to have all of these uh, general speeds and the, and the pseudo generalized speeds and we can find them how we would like um, as usual, so I'll have u, u r, and then we'll see um, q r and, uh, and q r uh, q dot and q r dot present, and then uh, q 
u r t all equals to zero and um, here I have uh, in general capital big N there right and with these generalized uh, kinematical differential equations I can then time differentiate this holonomic constraint so I'll get f dot of h as we did before but this time I can write it uh, all in terms of these generalized and pseudo generalized speeds right. and then this will be m equations there but just like in the non holonomic systems um, I can solve for these dependent speeds right so by nature by taking these time derivatives and the, how the chain rule works um, this fh dot is linear in um, these dependent generalized speeds so we can solve for them we can do that explicitly and um, as we've done before many times in other systems you know it's going to basically be something like this I have to get to introduce this coefficient matrix for the U, um, R terms and I'm going to call it now um, uh, HD for H dot right uh, times some vector GD or GHD there and then this will be M one inverse and we could solve for those right and, and we could do those uh, find the symbolic solutions and then we could sub use this to substitute in to our equations to form uh, a final set of equations So what would that look like? Um, we would still have this uh, holonomic constraint. Right? That doesn't go away. Have m of those. But we can substitute ur into our kinematical differential equations. And that's going to leave us with a set of equations that are a function of these variables. So QR uh, is left in there, but we don't have uh, a QR dot, right? And also we don't have a UR because we've eliminated it with uh, our solution here. I can also have T explicitly. And then we actually only need, right, the little n of these associated with our actual degrees of freedom of the system and then similarly if we substitute in UR um, we will be able to write the dynamical differential equations as U dot as a function of uh, U dot U Q QR will also be present T uh, all equal to zero and then we'll have one dynamical differential equation for each of the degrees of freedom of this system Okay, so now we have m plus 2n equations there. And uh, we, could pretend, we can solve this set of equations for the unknowns, right? We have u, q, and then qr is the only remaining thing, which is a big m. So we have the same number of unknowns if we were to try to uh, solve for u dot and q dot there. Right. So these equations are actually um, ODEs. Um, 
that have this extra QR term and um, you could integrate them right we could uh, do we could just take these two these two sets of equations um, and as long as we uh, have all of these uh, 2n plus m variables we can then calculate the time derivatives and move forward in time so fk and fd can be integrated as ordinary differential equations as long as we provide initial conditions that satisfy the constraints so that means that q at time 0 QR at time zero, and zero must equal zero. So uh, as long as the initial conditions But um, you'll see, and I won't do that in this uh, video lecture, but in the online notes, you, uh, I demonstrate that there is ultimately a problem with this, right? So in the numerical integration process, um, we already know that uh, errors can uh, build up uh, just in um, ordinary differential equations due to the nature of floating point arithmetic and the truncation error of the given um, integration method. Um, and those are compounded if uh, we have these holonomic constraints. If I start at time zero with the constraints satisfied, as, um, and then I integrate these equations forward in time, these constraints are not guaranteed to stay um, satisfied throughout time. And in fact, the numerical error, the truncation error, will contribute to these constraints are no longer staying valid as we proceed through time. Okay, so um, uh, I'll just write that real quickly. And you can check out the online notes and see how this four bar linkage, um, if I just do the naive approach here, uh, give it the initial conditions that things um, end up going a bit haywire. Uh, but there's a number of ways to deal with that depending on your needs. So there's several techniques for ensuring that these holonomic constraints um, over the integration period and uh, Uh, I think I missed something here for uh, ensuring that da da da, da that f f h equals zero over an integration period. Um, but most uh, and most of these involve correcting the state 
in each integration step. All right. And I'll post some references um, in the online notes if you want to learn more about that, uh, how these um, work. But for our purposes, we're going to use um, a solver that does this and it does that correction. Um, so we're going to use a differential algebraic equation solver. And it's very similar to solve IP, solve, solve IBP from uh, SciPy. It will solve the initial value problem, but for um, a set of DAEs. Um, and then for use in Python. And there's a number of these solvers, uh, but we're going to use one that's provided by the package uh, scikits.odes. That's the title. It provides also a DAE software. Um, and it gives access it has a wrapper to a solver that's called IDA or IDA and uh, that stands for implicit Differential algebraic solver. Okay. Um, it applies the um, um, an implicit uh, um, uh, backwards differentiation solver with the uh, corrections to the manage this uh, ensure that the constraint constraints are satisfied okay and um, if you look at the solve IBP documentation it also provides a uh, backwards differentiation uh, solver and I think I'm saying something wrong there but uh, um, it, so the IDA one uses a similar thing but manages this algebraic constraint also all right so there's a few key things to that, that you'll have to worry about that are different for this solver. One is that you're going to provide the equations of motion including the constraints um, in uh, implicit form. So before, we've always solved for the u dots and the q dots, but here you don't need to. Uh, you actually just will apply, uh, give entire equations that will look in general like so. All right, so this implicit form, we're going to give that side of the equation. Um, you're going to have to identify which equations are consistent, or sorry, are the constraints, which is uh, not too big of a deal. Um, but you're also going to have to ensure that the initial conditions are satisfied. And there's one difference here. Um, we're going to have to set the initial conditions for the u dots. All right, it is that. Um, uh, so the u dots, the u's, and the q's. Right. And so we didn't have to ensure that this con initial condition is satisfied, but we'll we'll need to do that in this case. And. You also will need to select tolerances for the integrator. Okay. 
to minimize the uh, constraint and I'll call these uh, constraint residuals right so if I calculate uh, if I plug in the numbers at any given time step and I calculate the uh, constraint equation of H it's going to give me a number that's not zero and uh, and you want to keep that value as close to zero as possible we'll call that value the residuals there all right so let's try this we're gonna do example we're gonna go back to the four bar linkage problem we've already figured out what the holonomic constraints are in a prior chapter and um, and so we're gonna work that out and try to integrate these equations with uh, the DAE solver there right if I can find my mouse all right, so we're going to do this four bar linkage. I have it displayed here to remind you what it looks like. Um, recall uh, looking at the right hand side here, I've got the uh, three links um, A, B, and C. And I've disconnected the links at P4. And then we find the open loop kinematics. Um, with the coordinates q1, q2, and q3. And then we're going to introduce a constraint that ensures that uh, this endpoint of C um, stays put on the location of the fourth link, which is a, the ground or the N uh, frame here. Uh, here. And then each of the links, right, LA, LB, LC, and LN are the distances that we have. Right? So um, over in the notebook, I've introduced all the variables. Um, we've got the lengths. Uh, so I've got a P vector here that has all of my constants. But I've also added a mass, M. I'm going to treat each of the uh, moving particles. In this case, it's only going to be P2 and P3 in the end uh, with a mass M. I'm also going to have a gravity a force that acts in the negative uh, in y direction. So I'm added a couple of constants for that. And then I've got a number of uh, vectors here that uh, I have one for q, which is the uh, independent generalized coordinate. Then I have these dependent coordinates, qr, which are going to be q2 and q3. I'll make those dependent. And then I have this Q capital N that contains all of the coordinates, the total amount of coordinates. And then similarly for the U's, right? And I'm going to use just uh, Q dots equal the U's in this case to keep it simple. And then I have a Q dot vector there and a, and a U dot that will become useful. We already did this in the prior uh, lecture on holonomic constraints, but I set up some um, positions and then I create the holonomic loop constraint and I can get FH here so we get two scalar constraint equations that look like so and now we want to move forward and uh, formulate the equations that I described in the prior notes so the first step I'm going to do is introduce the kinematical difference equations and we're going to introduce one of them these for all of the coordinates that we have present so um, we can say fk equals sm dot matrix and then I will do a uh, u1 minus q1 uh, diff so we'll just do a simple u equals the q dots and then I'll follow through with the other twos And I guess I could do that more simply. I think I have a Q in Q dot in and a U, right? And a U in. So if I just did 
Okay, yeah, so the, we can more simply just do uh, u in minus q d in. And that gives us the kinematical differential equations. And then uh, these are very simple, so we don't have to go through the full solution, but I, I will anyway. So I'll do a mk equals fk Jacobian. And then uh, it's going to be q and d, right? And then gk will just be u. In. and then uh, q dot solution is negative mk dot lu solve gk and then qd ripple equals zip q dot in QD so QD REPL <clears throat> so we've got the replacement vector we got um, and now what we want to do is differentiate time differentiate the non whole number constraints so if I do that I get these expressions here I've got Q dots in them but let's replace those with the U's And then I'll call that F H D. So here we have the time differential of the holonomic constraints. And if you inspected these, these actually you would see that these are just the um, components of velocity of that point P4 um, that we're setting to zero there. And it'll go for the if we differentiate it again, that would be the same for the accelerations. Um, and we could even check that, right? If I did p four dot velocity and n, if I can type it, um, well, I haven't defined any velocities yet, so never mind on that. We can check it later. So we've got that. These things are a function of. The Q's and the U's, and then U two and U three are we're going to call those our dependent U's here. And these are these pseudo generalized speeds, and let's solve for those. So if I uh, now do um, M F uh, M D eight M H D, I believe is what I call it, right? Um, it's going to be F H D dot Jacobian. And then I want to give it the U R. And then GK will be FHD dot Jacobian UR zero, which I think we need to create. So I'll do that. UR zero equals URI zero for URI and UR. And then we'll get a UR solution equals MHD. And that should be GHD. U minus dot LU solve GHD and then uh, UR REPL take the zip UR UR solve. Um, data type not understand, understood. Oh, yeah. Type Jacobian here. This is supposed to be X replace. There we go. And then you are a rebel. So these now we can use to replace the U2 and U3 with expressions that only have U1 in them, just like we did with the non holonomic constraints. So the key thing is we sort of create these fake non holonomic constraints in some sense, and then we follow the same process as before. I don't want to spend 
an awful lot of time on the rest of that process because it's no different than the, the prior process. So if I come to uh, the notes, we made it down to this uh, UR REPL stage. And the next stage is to create these velocities. So I'm going to write my velocities, the angular velocities and the linear velocities, such that they're only in terms of U1, which is our only um, actual generalized speed. So I'm going to copy these and execute them here. So that will set the angular velocities of A, B, and C only in terms of U1. And then I'll grab the velocities here for each of the points. And it shows that last one. If I check that last one, P4 dot velocity and N, and then I think I'll have to give it a reference frame equals N, I can see that it's only a function of U1. So I've uh, we don't have u2 or u3 th uh, present in the velocities there, which is what we want. All right, so no different than the prior. And um, this step here is to make sure our kinematical differential equations also don't have any u2 or u3 in it. If I do that, and then me.find dynamic symbols of gk is only a function of u1. All right. Okay, so we've done those replacements. We we have the velocities of the points. The next we could calculate our partial velocities now only with respect to u1. And um, uh, notice though that q2 and q3 are present in all these uh, equations, right? Those dependent coordinates are going to be present. And we're going to have to deal with them later when we come to integrating the equations. But uh, we've eliminated u2 and u3 and um, have these now in a favorable set. The next step is to f uh, create the dynamical differential equations. We only have to create one, right, because we only have an FR uh, that is made up. We only have one generalized speed, so we only have to create that one. So I'm going to just copy. We've got gravity acting on only two of the particles there, right, on P2 and P3 are the only ones that are going to move. So we'll have gravity act on those. And then um, I'm going to grab this and we'll talk about it over here. But this is going to be our F1. Um, right? So we have the partial velocity right there with respect to U1 of P2 dotted with the resultant on P2 and then the same for P3. And that gives us the um, generalized active forces. Right. No problem. And then we got to get the generalized inertia forces. And one key thing is we're going to calculate these accelerations. So let's have a look at that. If I do uh, P3 at AC and N and ME.find dynamic symbols that acceleration has uh, Q dots in it, right, and a U1 dot. We only want a U1 dot. We don't want any Q dots. So if I do an X replace Q dot ripple, that now puts everything in terms of U1, U2, and U3. We want to get rid of U2 and U3. So then we would X replace um, UR ripple. And then we have only in terms of u1, u1 dot, and the q1s. So that's going to be our acceleration. Oops. And we're going to need uh, both p2 and p3. Right. And I think p th p3 p2 probably doesn't have. Well, we'll just do that, and I'll I'll just label them as uh, n a p2 and n a p3 all right so we only have particles moving in a plane we'll only need to calculate the linear accelerations of them 
and I'm going to then copy um, we only need a RSP2 it's going to be negative M times N A P2 RS P3 equals negative M times N A P3 so those are the inertial uh, forces, uh, resultant forces, and then I'm going to grab here our F1S, right? So we have, once again, the partial velocity P2 and the partial velocity of P3, only with respect to U1, and then I dot them with the two resultant forces, and I get F1S, right? So our F, we check what these things are made up of. We've got F1 and F1S. So we've, we've got the dependent coordinates and the independent coordinate Q1, and then we only have a U1 dot and a U1. So no, none of these pseudo generalized speeds of the derivative show up in the equations of motion. So we look like we are in pretty good shape. We now have F D right, equals F one plus F one S, and it's only a single equation. F R plus F R star, and uh, we've got our equations of motion at this point. So we have F H. Fk and Fk really should be x replace the ur ripple. So Fk looks more like this, and then we've got Fd, which I'm not going to print to the screen because it'll be even larger there. Right? Okay. So um, I think that's the main pieces. I'm going to grab a few other things just so we can get some numbers. So here's some numerical values for the constants. Just bring those in. And I am going to just grab that one. All right, so I want to pick, I'm going to pick some initial conditions for this system. We know that Q1 is our independent, single independent generalized speed, and U1 is our single independent um, so I'm going to, uh, generalized speed. So we really only get to set those two things. So I'm going to set this thing initially at rest with U1 equals zero, and then Q1 um, at the initial condition will give it an angle of 10 degrees. All right. So I'll set those two initial coordinates. We now need to initialize the rest of the system here. We need to know well what are Q2 and Q3, the two dependent coordinates. Um, we don't need to calculate U2 and U3 because they're already built into our equations. Um, they will be calculated because I've substituted in these. But we will need to calculate the initial conditions for the um, uh, Q1 dot variable. And that comes from our dynamic equations. We have to solve for, sorry, that was U1 dot. We have to solve for U1 dot and then um, find that value for the initial state. So let's start with um, finding out what Q2 and Q3 are. We're going to need to do that for the initial conditions. And we're going to import from scipy.optimize, import fsolve. And fsolve is a function that will help us solve a set of nonlinear equations. And that's what our holonomic constraints are. So we know that um, we can solve for Q2. Q3 given Q1, um, fsol finds the roots of a function. All right, so it can be any nonlinear function, and it can be a vector function. So we can have as uh, many equations and as many unknowns as we want. 
uh, if you look at the documentation here, we have to give it a starting estimate for the roots. So it, nonlinear equations in general don't have multiple solutions, so you have to give it a good guess for it to give you a proper result there. Um, we have to create a function here that evaluates the non homonomic constraints given the unknowns we want to solve for, x. We give it a guess, and then we solve it, and it uh, finds our solution. So here's an example. You create a function. It has two equations. It has two unknowns, x0 and x1. It's nonlinear, right? There's a cosine and an x and times an x. You then call f solve using the function and give it a guess, and then it gives you an answer. And those two uh, results should then satisfy that function. So this example sort of checks that. So let's see what that looks like for us. I'll write out. Um, we we'll need to evaluate the uh, FH, right? So let's lambdify that. FH is going to be a function of only the coordinates, so I'm going to give it uh, QN, and I'm going to give it uh, P, right, because it's also a function of the lengths. And then we're going to give FH here, and that should give us uh, allow us to be able to execute that. Um, so if I do eval FH, and there, and I give it just three random values for the cubes and then I give it p vowels we should get a result so that works now we need a function that works with f-solve f-solve is solving for only q2 and q3 and those in a vector um, a numpy array with only those two values has to be the first argument so I'm going to create a python function here and I'll call it um, uh, f-solve uh, fh it's going to take um, the QR as the first argument, <clears throat> and then it'll take Q1 as the second argument, and then P, whatever the numerical values of the uh, constants are. And then um, I'm going to eval FH. I'll use our function we already made. And um, we have to np.hstack q1 and qr as the first three arguments there, and then p. Right? Is that right? I think that looks right. So that will make sure that um, the first argument is length 2. That's what we're going to be solving for. And this will be our guess. We'll have to guess this value, q1. And then, um, I'm sorry, we're going to be solving for QR. Uh, we'll guess also QR, uh, but we'll give uh, Q1 as a fixed value and P as fixed values. So that evaluates that. Let's also squeeze this. So I'm going to return the squeezed version so we get a 1D array. Right. And I create that function. We'll test it f solve fh takes 1.0, oh, sorry, if I copy what I had before, it would be 2.0, 3.0, and then we give it 1.0, and then we give it p vowels. And I get the same results there, but on, now in a 1D array. Okay? We're going to need a guess for qr. So you should have a look at your system, sketch it out, think about what those values are, and try to give it or as most reasonable guess as you can. So I have uh, a guess for QR here that I'll copy. And I'm going to say, that, uh, when I looked at the system, um, if I give a guess for Q2 of 10 degrees and negative 150 for Q3, that that might work out for the way I drew the coordinates. And if I look over to the left side there, if I set Q1 to 10 degrees, which is quite low, then um, I'm giving a, a guess for Q2 will be uh, 10 degrees up and then negative 150 to bring the link all the way back down to P4. So hopefully I think well, 
copied it from the notes there, so it should work. So we get our guess, right? And then f solve should work. We give our function we made, f solve fh. And then we give um, our guess, qr guess. And then for q1 p vowels, we can give that as args, just like we do for solve ivp. So I have q. One zero and p bounds. I think that should work. So it gives a result there. This is in radians. And then if I p dot radian to degree, I can think about that a little bit easier. Six degrees and negative one fifty one. So reasonably close on my guesses, and it's found the solution. Seems reasonable. We'll have to plot it later to see more clearly if that in fact found what we want, but I'll just trust that my numbers are correct for now. So this actually gives Q2 initial and Q3 initial. Right? So we have Q1 0, Q2 0, Q3 0. And we've solved for all of those. One thing on that F solve like they, it does have a tolerance here, right? So it only found it only satisfies those constraints down to this 1.49012 e to the negative eight, and you can make that tighter down to machine precision if you need to. Um, and then there's some other settings too um, that could be useful depending on your system. But this works for us. We could though set uh, x tall to be. 1e negative uh, 14 maybe and then we'll get a little more maybe a little more accurate result there for our initial q1 all right so these should satisfy our constraints let's check that eval fh if i give it q1 say i'm going to just make a uh, well eval fh and then i give it uh, q1 0 q2 0 q3 0 it's the first argument is p vowels there it is very nicely uh, down to high precision even uh, i get zero there so our constraints are satisfied with these values of q1 q2 and q3 notice if i give a different um, I'm going to copy that. Weirdly, it won't let me copy. There we go. Um, I could, if I gave a guess here of uh, just 1.0 and 1.0, so maybe bad guesses. Notice that I get different results, right, compared to uh, my Q2 and Q3 right here. It's got 3.64 instead of the negative value. So it actually finds a different solution, and it's, and it's like a, a valid solution. So be careful that you are solving for the configuration that you want. But we have our initial configuration values, and we're going to need our initial um, u1 dot value okay so we have fd right and this we can now that we know q1 q2 q3 initial u1 initial which i'm just going to say it starts at rest we can call calculate what u1 dot is and fd is linear in u1 so if i um, do fd dot diff with respect to u1 dot right and then um, we can call that md and then I can call gd fd dot x replace u1 diff of zero <coughs> And uh, so I have md times u1 dot plus gd, 
then I have u1 solution equals negative m uh, gd just simply divided by md. All right, and then I'm going to lambdify that. So eval u1 equals sm dot lambdify. It should only be a function of uh, u1 and the all of the q's, which I can say is qn, and then I give it u1 solution there. I think that worked. And now if I eval u1 for our u1 0 and then q1 0, q2 0, and q3 0. That didn't, oh I forgot p-vals, right? p-vals and give uh, Cannot sign to literal. Oh, P. Uh, it's good to be P. And P. And then I give it P balance. There we go. I get a number. So this is actually the initial acceleration. So we call that U1 dot U1 dot zero. All right, so we use the dynamic equations to give us that initial value of the acceleration. All right, so now we have all of the initial values we need. Do u1 zero and u1 dot zero. So that's our initial values that we're going to need for the DAE solver that we're going to use. Um, if I missed anything, I think we're set up good. Set up well. Um, yeah. All right, so we're not going to use solve IVP, right? Because that's only for ordinary differential equations. But on Vocarium, and you can install it yourself, there's a package called scikit.odes, uh, scikits.odes. So from scikits.odes import DAE. So it has a DAE solver, a generic interface class to a differential algebraic equations. We define our equations um, as the this RES stands for residual equals the implicit form of the differential equations. And um, da, 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 da. you can give some options and things. Um, we have to create a residual function here, much like we do with solve IP, that looks like this. It says uh, a function it takes the uh, independent variable, time, it's going to be ours, they call it x here, the array of unknowns in x, okay, this is now going to be um, all of the q's, the u1 and the un, uh, all of the q's and the u1. And then there's y prime, that will be u1 dot. All right? And then this return residual is a little odd too. It's a bit different. We actually have to, it's going to take an array that has this thing called the residual and um, populate that array with numbers. Okay, so it doesn't create the array inside the function, it's just going to populate the values. And like here's a small example. You give the initial conditions for x and x prime. This is with respect to t, so they give a value t, x, x dot. All right, so we have to give um, x and x dot. And then we give this result value, and then it populates the results, which are the residuals. And then we're going to solve it after that. But let's set up this function first. All right, so we're going to uh, eval the equations of motion, and we need to have it take the form that this DAE function needs. All right, it's going to take the time. It's going to take the state vector. It's going to take the state derivative vector, 
and then it's going to take some um, residual array that we're going to populate and this residual array is just going to be filled with FH, FK, and FB, all of the equations in motion. And we're going to evaluate the implicit right, uh, side of, of those. Okay, so <clears throat> what is this going to look like? Um, we're going to have to eval FH, we're going to have to eval FK, and we're going to have to eval FD. All right. And then once we calculate those, we know that this is a going to give us a two by a two length, right? We have two holonomic constraint scalar equations. This is going to give us um, for our fk um, we have three, yeah. And then for FD, it's going to be 1. will give us U dot. So this will be the residual. And it'll be the first two. Um, so 0 to 2. And then we'll set residual 2 to um, Five and so the next three and residual five to the end equals FB. Yeah, to get the last one, and I guess it would technically just be. I think that looks good. All right. Well, we have an eval FH. Um, I don't think we have an eval FK. So let's create those. Um, eval FK. First, remind ourselves what is in FK. Find dynamic symbols. We don't want all of FK, right? We only want a single one here because we only want to do the U1 equals to Q1 dot, right? So this is just going to be 2 to 3 and 3. We can actually make it uh, 0, 1, Two, three. All right, so let's look at. Uh, we don't really need to eval FK. We need to make that function. All we need to do is know that we're going to do Q1 dot right, U1 minus Q1 dot. We'll be that, but we do need to create this eval FD. So that one will be a little bit trickier. So let's check FD. All right, so it has Q1, Q2, Q3, U1, and U1 dot. One thing that Lambda Phi is not gonna like, it's not really gonna like this U1 dot term. So what we're gonna do is uh, take FD and let's create a U1 dot equals SM dot. We can just make it a symbol. We don't have to differentiate it. U, um, let's just do UND there. And then fd dot x replace u1 diff with u1 dot. All right. So that's what we want to evaluate. This will work better with lambda phi. So we'll do sm dot lambda phi. And then we're going to give it uh, the q in u1. And this new u1 dot symbol and p. That should let us eval fd. 
looks like it works. So I replace this symbol here because um, I think uh, Lambda if I won't like the uh, that variable there. So if I if we I can just prove that to you. So if I take away FD x replace and we put a u1 diff here well, it might have worked it may have worked I had trouble with that before I might I might have trouble evaluating with the diff but we'd have to check that anyways I think what I'm doing here is safe you can if you hit the error you'll see why I did that but uh that should evaluate things we can check it eval FD um, we can do Q1 0, Q2 0, Q3 0, give some value for U1, some value for U1 dot, and then p-vals, and we get a number there that evaluates the residual. Alright, that's eval FD, and then eval FH. And I can't quite remember what does eval fh take. We got to give it um, qn and p, it looks like. All right. So um, let's extract those, right? qn equals, it's going to be the first three values of x u1 will be the fourth value in x right and then u1 dot will be the fourth value in x dot right we we'll also need q1 dot which is going to be the first value in x dot so we've extracted qn, un dot, da 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 da. da. We're also going to let this take p, because yeah, we're going to need that inside. <clears throat> now we can eval fh, which takes qn, and p, p. Um, our un minus qn dot there no problem for the res that second residual and then eval fh right takes q in u1 u1 dot and p all right so that's our function i think it should work the key thing to test this is we got to create this vector to store the results in so the results are of length four so i'm just going to make an empty array uh, or zeros of length four zeros right so we're going to use this and then pass it into this eval uh, eom function to populate it and let's see if that works eval eom uh, some arbitrary time value let's give it q1 zero q2 zero q3 0 and u1 0 as the state and then as the um, uh, I've got to get u2 dot and u3 dot here too I guess I'm just going to put in some numbers though just to test this and we're going to come back to that so it takes 4 for xd it takes the residual and it takes p Vowels. If I run that, we get an error. Could not broadcast input. Oh yeah, we probably need to squeeze this as well as this. And it seems like something works. Nothing is returned from eval eom because it just populates this residual vector which now it has some numbers in it. So it looks like we're we're on the right track. But the only thing I missed here is what is uh
uh, u two dot initial and u three dot initial. And did I do that in the here? X dot, oh yeah, q1 dot, q2 dot, and q3 dot. Well, if q1 dot is zero, which we've set it to be, right, no motion, it starts at rest, those will all also be zero. So we're safe. You might have to, if you didn't make those zero, then you would have to calculate them. So this would technically be um, zero, 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 and u1 dot zero. Uh, make that so we can see all the arguments so this is our state vector this is state derivative vector our residual in the p vowels and this is time yep and uh right that for us i'll just label them q1 q2 q3 and u1 that's the state vector and then this would q1 dot q Two dot q three dot and u one dot right boom there we go i think it's working yep so now if i put in constraint all these values now satisfy the constraints in the dynamics and so i get a zeros as my result and this would probably be smarter to make this ones so I can prove that and that it changes it to all zeros and this is zeros down to our machine precision basically all right I think our e eval eom function works all right now we're going to set up the DAE solver so I'm going to copy this and just talk through what we have here so there's this da function we first have to tell it which solver to use and uh, I think it, ha it may have some other options for differential algebra equation solvers but we're going to use the uh, IDA solver which is the underlying sundials um, implicit differential algebra equation solver we're going to give it the eval eom function all right hopefully we've designed it properly above i think we probably have you can set the relative tolerance and the absolute tolerances in the integration and these are the default values i'm just going to comment those out so we'll see what it does um, without those set we have to tell it which indexes idx are the algebraic equations so i did it a little different than in the um, uh, on my notes it's actually zero and one are the the first two in the residual are the algebraic equations so let's change those to zero and one right um, we use this user data to pass in the p vowels right because I added this extra argument that is not part of the default um, function signature that DAE wants we got a helicopter oh wait so I pass uh, p vowels there and this old API thing well I just set it false because um, I guess scikit.ods has a, a different output that you can get from the solver uh, that's an old one and uh, we're going to just use the new one because I assume it'll change to that uh, at some point in and uh, so this will give us give us the new gives us new output uh, format right and I think that should set things up it gives us a solver this works a little bit different than solve IVP2 uh, we now call um, solve like this so you say solver dot solve you give it the time values you want and you give it the initial state and the initial state derivatives all right let me create a new cell we need our x o equals np dot array q1 
0, q2, 0, q3, 0. And then our x dot 0 is np dot array. Right, it's just uh, at rest. So we have u1, 0. That's 0, though. Store. These will two be 0 in our case, but uh, you may need to solve, uh, solve those for other problems or figure out what those are precisely. And then um, we've got uh, u1 dot 0, right? We need some time values, so let's just do in, uh, ts equal. I think I have an m ts equals np dot lin space. Uh, let's go from zero to four seconds, and then 401 time steps, and then hopefully this thing will solve. We got a value error. The oh, do I not have things the same length? Oh yeah, You're right. I don't. This is supposed to be u one zero, and this is just supposed to be zero. All right. So it's integrating equations. Uh, it took a couple seconds there. The values are now stored in this solution. Dot values dot t gives us the time values. 0 to 4 seconds, and y gives us all of the state variables. All right. So we should be able to plot that. Um, let me just do a simple plot. So if I do ax dot plot solution dot values dot t and then solution dot values dot y, I get a solution here. So things uh, look like it's moving. Um, we would need to animate it and uh, inspect whether we're getting uh, realistic motion, and we should. You know, th and then think about more carefully whether we're getting um, the world results that we expect. I can copy this um, plot function that I have so we can look at it more closely, but I do want to uh, grab this eval constraints function. All right. So this is an important part. We want to make sure, we want to see if the constraints hold through the entire simulation. So I have a function that I wrote here. It takes the simulation results, right, the state vectors versus time, is that excess, and the p-values, p -values, and it's going to evaluate their um, fh. And I think I have fh defined a little bit differently. Our fh takes qn comma p. So um, I can just do, I believe, XIP there. And I think that will work. So our constraints will be eval constraints. And then I'll give it uh, solution.values.y and pval. And we get an error, too many values to unpack. One, two, three. Oh yeah, it doesn't take any of the U's, so this is supposed to just be um, XI zero to three, I believe. All right, that probably will work. And now I'm going to copy my plot function that I created somewhere here, so we don't have to write that over again. There we go. Plot results. Plot results function takes the time values, the states, and then the constraints. And um, I have things out of order though. All right? No, it'll it'll work for this. Everything matches. So let's create that plot results, and then let's call it. 
So plot results will take um, the time values. So solution dot values dot time, the state values solution dot values dot y, and then um, it takes the constraint values which we just calculated, and hopefully I get a nice picture. Looks like we did. All right, so now we can see more clearly what's going on. Um, we've got our three angles. So Q1 starts at this uh, 10 degrees, and then it uh, does almost a full, or close to a full rotation. This is in degrees, and then back. Q2 then goes in the opposite direction, almost uh, the same magnitude, and then back. So they're sort of behaving opposite of each other. And then um, Q3, starting at this very negative number, uh, decreases in value um, or magnitude, I guess. Closer to back towards zero and then back. And then uh, the key thing here is that I check the constraints. And we can see that our two constraint values hold within 2 e to the negative 6 or negative 4 e to the negative 6 and um, and they're holding at least to that if I want to tighten things up you can always uh, work with the the tolerances here so if I now make my relative tolerances and my absolute tolerance and the absolute tolerance I think is going to matter uh, well, you can read about what the difference in those two are, but anytime these values come close to zero, the absolute tolerance is what plays in the most significant role. When they're away from zero, it'll be the relative tolerance. So let's just run those cells again, and the uh, solution will probably take a little bit longer because we've tightened up the integration tolerances. There we go. We get some results. And if I plot the final results, now I can see that everything's within 4 e to the negative 10 there. So we've tightened up these constraints. So I think we've got a solution that works. It looks like uh, it's the same result uh, as what I have here. Um, I could probably animate it really quickly if these things work. I'll just grab in the setup animation. That looks like it's okay. And animate linkage function. And, and then finally try to animate it. Um, and I haven't defined this, so let's do excess equals solution dot values dot y FPS. I had a hundred right samples per second, I think, above. So let me take a minute to run. But the key thing while we wait for the animation to create is that we've uh, used now a proper differential algebraic equation solver we give the equations in the implicit form here where it uh, evaluates the right hand side of fh fk and fd right and uh, and it makes sure that these constraints are held uh, to whatever tolerances we desire throughout the integration of this initial value problem with these we have to set up the proper you know all of our initial conditions but and the derivatives at uh, the initial state have to um, uh, be satisfied and I think we may have an animation then so there we go it uh, moves you can see this thing jiggling around a bit but it's only uh, an artifact of the animation it is held to this quite tight tolerance which would be a bit difficult to to see right so there you go. Now you can simulate a holonomic system um, uh, that has an ex extra explicit holonomic constraints. Um, this same method can be used for if you have uh, non-holonomic and holonomic. You basically combine the last two lectures.
and you can get the uh, results there. But um, uh, that's it. I think uh, I've talked enough, an hour and a half, and um, there's more details in the online notes. Thank you very much.